Okay, we're back. We're live. It must be, what, Tuesday morning. I'm Jay Fidel, and this is Community Matters. And we're talking with Chad Blair of Civil Beat. Uh, Chad, is a, Chad is a name in news, and we, are, we really enjoy having him on the program. Hi, Chad. Hi, Jay. Where are you? That's quite a backdrop you have. Well, this is our newsroom here at Think Tech, Chad, and I know that's your newsroom over there at Civil Beat. <laughs> this, in fact, we can give is, you a tour. Uh, I, I could turn the camera around, but then I'm sure I'd screw something up. But I am actually at my at my desk uh, at Civil Beat. I am the only one uh, in the office right now. Uh, it, we have the entire crew has been operating uh, social distancing like everybody else. On occasion, you will see someone come in. We have folks that do uh, podcasts, and so they need to use some of the equipment that we have here. Uh, but, but that's it. I think also we have people come in to do payroll once a week, so that's a good thing. It's I'll tell great. you this. It, it, yeah, in this day and age, it's really great to uh, uh, be receiving a paycheck for the work that we're doing. These are very scary times. Well, may I say, uh, Civil Beat doing a great job in a crisis. And it's really um, to your credit, to the Civil Beat's credit, to the, the credit of the media, the, you know, the committed media that, that sees this as a, an important part of their mission, you know, stepping up to the crisis. I think uh, I appreciate that, and I, I know the public appreciates that. Um, and it's great to have you on the show to talk about it. So this is, uh, this is sort of in response to an article which was in the New, York, New Yorker magazine. Um, let's see, it was called The Fate of the Media After the Corona in and after the, the corona crisis. And um, the, the media, although it's stepping up and although some, some media are more popular now, perhaps because of the crisis and all the news that we have and need to have about the crisis, um, the, the concern in this article is what is gonna happen um, you know, as we, as, we, as we attend to the crisis and as the crisis subsides. Uh, and I think it's worth talking about that because going into the crisis, we had a war on the press. We had a lot of newspapers, about half the, the, the print newspapers in the country, uh, you know, have failed over the past four or five years. Uh, journalists are out of work. There's uh, fewer left now than ever. Um, and so, um, you know, we need to look down the road and see what models work. This is the subject of our, of our uh, symposium back in September at which you appeared. Sure. Um, and what models work, what models work in the future, and how it's going to be. And the problem is that, you know, the only way you can do responsible news is if you have enough money to pay the journalists, <laughs> and you have to find a model to do that. So um, can you talk about, for example, the model that Civil Beat adopted a few years ago, moving for, from a, a profit model, a subscription model, as I recall, to a nonprofit? That, that was actually a good, a good move, wasn't it? It, it was. Um, I'm the only uh, original uh, reporter still on the staff. I guess I can't find a job elsewhere, but <laughs> but uh, we started back in 2010 as a for-profit. We had a paywall. And at that time, it was around the same time that the Honolulu uh, Star Bulletin and the Honolulu Advertiser became one paper, right? The Star Advertiser. And sure enough, they put up a paywall. Uh, but somewhere along the way, the decision was made to switch to the nonprofit model. It is a model that a number of organizations, media organizations on the mainland are pursuing uh, with some success. And it has, it really has been remarkable. I, I would say that it has saved Civil Beat and made it grow. We are actually prospering. Uh, the staff, uh, the reach is larger than it was, far larger than when we started. And it is one model uh, to pursue as a possible way uh, to save journalism in the 21st century. I believe within the last uh, month or so, that's about how long we've been in this pandemic, really, um, I think about 28,000 journalists have lost their jobs. The last figure that I saw come out, I don't know if it was the Columbia Journalism Review or, or which report, but uh, tens of thousands, just like so many millions of people that are out of work uh, here in Hawaii and across the nation. So we're very grateful and uh, the pandemic for now, at least it's been a, a real opportunity for the nation to see how important, frankly, how essential uh, the media is in these very serious times. Yeah. You know, I remember you and I worked for Michael Titterton at uh, Hawaii Public Radio it was 10 yeah. years ago already. And, um, and one of the interesting things that he, he told me one time, I asked him, I said, why don't you just get some big donors or big advertisers <laughs> with big bucks 
and have them support Hawaii Public Radio. Why, why are you having these fund drives? We, you know, we get small amounts of money from lots of people. He says, well, you realize that they're more than just uh, contributors. Uh, they're invested. Um, there, there is a statement of relationship. Uh, they like us. We like them. We have a love fest going on with every one of them. Uh, and it means they listen. It means they carry, you know, they carry the word for us. They advocate for us in the community you know, and they encourage other people to listen and so forth. And that's what we need. So it's not just one big donor or one big advertiser. It's all the little guys. And I think that when you go, as you did uh, in Civil Beat, um, you know, to a, a nonprofit model, a lot of people who invested their heart and soul, who do and are investing their heart and soul into the organization, they become part of your family. Um, and that's better than an advertiser, isn't it? Oh, I think so. I think family is the right word for it. Um, I think ownership is another word to use as well. It, it really becomes, in our case, their online news source, HPR, by the way, uh, is a media partner. I'm on regularly on the conversation and sometimes uh, other reporters and editors are on as well. And we are both nonprofit. We, we don't run, uh, if you will, um, advertising per se. We don't have underwriters per se. Uh, we certainly have important organizations and a lot of individuals backing us. But I think that they feel like it's, how do I say it? Civil Beat is theirs. Uh, they feel that it's personal and that includes direct contact with the reporters, with the editors, that requires us to, to reach out into the community, not just be this uh, faceless, <laughs> nameless entity that you never speak with, but to have a real interaction. Uh, and of course, that, that, that word in Civil Beat, civil, right? That was something Piero Midiar and Randy Ching have insisted on from the beginning, that we keep it civil, or as a uh, as Michael Titterton would say, civil, civil beat, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's talk about the New York Times. You know, the article in the New Yorker was really instructive. Talk about a, a whole bunch of uh, their directors, their editorial board sat down in about uh, 2009, I think it was, and they decided they're going to have a paywall. Um, and it was a hard decision. It was a controversial decision with the New York organization. Everybody agreed. Um, and uh, they did have a payroll and a paywall, and it was successful, and it is successful today. But the problem is that most people out there in the community, they don't want to pay for news. There's so many other ways to get news, uh, and those and those ways are changing kaleidoscopically. I mean, for example, um, there have been what BuzzFeed and HuffPost, they're on the decline. They have shrunk their business, shrunk their journalism staff, shrunk their reach, I guess. Uh, we thought they were, you know, going to be the successor. They were going to be, you know, the most popular uh, in that category, that, that size and scope. Um, but unfortunately, it sounds like they have issues. Um, so the New York Times emerges as perhaps the most, at least for my, for my money, and I do pay them, for my money, uh, the most uh, important news source, uh, the original news source, right? Everybody quotes them. And they have 1,700 journalists. They've never had so many. And they have 5 million subscribers, according to The New Yorker. Uh, they've never had so many. And so you, I think we have to look at the model, the paywall model of The New York Times and The Washington Post and The Wall Street Journal, too, I think. There are a couple of others um, to see whether those are going to survive the coronavirus and be the healthiest model. Or is it going to be the nonprofit? Or is it going to be a combination? What do you think? I, you know, I don't know which one's going to win out. Um, remember that with the New York Times, it's owned by the Sulzberger family. So it's it's one family uh, with the the Washington Post, which I think is also uh, equally with the New York Times really doing terrific in terms of reporting and staying alive. Um, it's owned by Jeff Bezos, the, the owner of Amazon. And then remember the Wall Street Journal, uh, which I think also is doing a heck of a lot of good work. Uh, and it's owned by Rupert Murdoch. So you've really got wealthy people. And it, it's no uh, secret that Civil Beat's founder, publisher is Piero Midiar uh, of eBay and who lives here and, and, and loves Hawaii. But that is one model. Gee, do you need somehow a, a wealthy benefactor? I think what we're really finding out is that people are dying for news, literally dying. They're hungry for news. And when Civil Beat came along, particularly when you saw the two daily newspapers become one, there was really a, a there was another source to go to. Does it frustrate me that a lot of people think, oh, it's free. I can just read it anytime I want. 
Sure it does. It's, it's embarrassing. I'm working for a living. I, I really need your help. But we're seeing all sorts of uh, donors come our way from a, a wide variety of backgrounds. And it's heartening. Since this crisis has really started in the last month or so, I can't tell you how many uh, thank yous I've gotten. Emails, not just me, other staff. Thank you for being there. You know, we went from five days a week to seven days a week because of the coronavirus. We are publishing fresh content uh, every single day. And uh, we realize simply that this is what we have to do. And none of the staff are taking vacation time. We're trying to stagger things as best as possible. But um, this model is working as well. We're not going to be the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Wall Street uh, Journal, but maybe the Texas Tribune or other models elsewhere. And it is working for us. We are as strong as we've ever been. Yeah, it's true. And, um, you know, I, I don't know why I'm reminded of the old dichotomy. Again, are you going to cover stuff that mm, the public wants to know about? Or are you going to cover stuff that the public should know about? You know, it's the old the old uh, uh, TV network issue. I mean, should I talk about sports and crime and, and automobile mm -hmm. accidents and weather? Or should I talk about what's really going on? You know, and, and a lot of a lot of the uh, the network um, news uh, will say, no, we, we only cover what they want. If they don't want it, we're not going to cover it. But I think Civil Beat is different, and certainly Think Tech is different. We want to cover the things that we think they need to know. We want to take them to another level, not just flatten it out. Um, but, you know, one thing that strikes me, uh, what you said, is the Star Advertiser reported yesterday uh, they were not going to be publishing a print edition mm. on Saturdays anymore. Yeah. This is a this is more than one small isolated event, don't you think? Can you draw a trend out of that? It's a very serious matter. Let me just first begin by saying I have some very good friends uh, who work at the Star Advertiser. There's a lot of good folks over there producing very important stories. Uh, but in addition to canceling uh, come May, the print edition for Saturday. By the way, it'll still be online. They'll still be producing a full issue. On Saturdays, you're just not going to see it in print anymore. But re remember, they've had to make some hard decisions. There have been furloughs. There are people that are working, uh, you know, five days a week and getting paid for four days a week. Uh, there are people that I believe uh, are no longer working there. And they've had to make some content cuts. There are no more uh, sports. There's a very small sports section, but I mean, sports isn't happening, right? But teams aren't playing, and that includes high school sports. You haven't had entertainment. They've had to make a very difficult decision. And if you physically pick up the Star Advertiser, and believe me, I subscribe. I get it every morning at my front door at home. Uh, it's getting thinner and thinner. But I go to the Star Advertiser first thing in the morning because I want to see what's happening locally. And I consider it a compliment uh, to the work that we're doing at Civil Beat. Some of it overlaps, a lot of it, particularly now with coronavirus. But the trend line is worrisome. And uh, the longer this goes on, we all know what's happening to newspapers nationwide. We saw what happened with two daily newspapers here. And I think that trend is uh, continuing and is not going to ease up. Yeah. And uh, we, we're, we're, you know, with, with less, mm, less media members, there's less news. And then you're always subject to the risk, as, as on the mainland, where all these newspapers are consolidating and there's one editorial policy controlled by somebody. And if that person is, uh, has, a, say, a right wing agenda, then you have, you know, sometimes hundreds radio stations, you know, AM radio stations and small newspapers that are speaking the same language. And, and, and advocating for positions uh, because the notion of fact and opinion is a little blurred these days on those on those media. But you know, I want to I want to go to one thing and, uh, and sort of integrate uh, the coronavirus phenomenon, which is certainly drawing our attention because we realize uh, we realize and our listeners and viewers realize that we are in a transformation. Everything, every institution, everything right down to shaking the other guy's hand is, you know, is in transformation now. And when we come out the other end of the tunnel, it'll be different. And I think that's one of the reasons that people are so fascinated, because they know that things are changing dramatically and our lives are all going to be different. Um, but the other thing is Trump. Um, you know, Trump was, um, you know, of great interest to the media all around the country on one side of the question or the other. And I think that sold a lot of papers. It was very interesting. He, he's, a, he, he's a, an entertainer. 
And, um, and I think that kept a lot of papers going to cover him one side or the other. Um, and then, of course, his machinations in, in the coronavirus uh, crisis uh, heightened that. So now his machinations plus coronavirus, it's irresistible. Okay? So hopefully in November, we'll have a new president, a more moderate president, <laughs> uh, 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 an, ordinary, an ordinary person kind of president, an ordinary leader kind of president. Okay, and so you don't have that kind of raw meat thing going on every day uh, where the press finds all this stuff on Trump and they report it and it's, it's tonic in a way, you know, to bring him back to honesty. But, but when we don't have that, we don't have the scandals and the, you know, bizarre events from him. And hopefully soon we're finished with coronavirus. We're back to normal with the vaccine. God, this should be coming soon. Uh, <laughs> What's going to happen to the press then? There won't be as much of what Trump has created in terms of, you know, public interest in the news or in the disinformation, as the case may be. I'll admit, as a news consumer who reads uh, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and the New Yorker and the Star Advertiser and a whole lot of other uh, publications, as well as consuming online material and and, and TV and, and whatever that it might be. There's been nothing like uh, the Trump show uh, in the history of this nation. And I'll be honest with you, I'll, I'll pick up uh, the newspaper or go to a, an online clip and my eyes, my attention goes to what Trump did or said. I, I think there's a famous New Yorker cartoon in which uh, an airplane is getting ready to land and the pilot comes on the, the intercom and says, uh, you're, it's safe to turn on your mobile devices and see what he had to say now. <laughs> Something to that effect. <laughs> um, you, you cannot turn your your eyes and ears away from it. He is a fascinating. I say this uh, apolitically. He's a fascinating figure. He is an entertainer. He's also the president of the most powerful country in the world. And one wonders whether something is starting to shift. The poll numbers are starting to indicate that maybe maybe we're getting tired of the Trump show. I do believe, however, and you and I were talking earlier, that his core supporters, and it's about 40% of the nation, 35, 40, sometimes 42, will never turn from him, will never leave him. And that's the base that Trump is playing for. Uh, and unless the Democratic Party can run a successful campaign, uh, I'll say this about Donald Trump. He's a hell of a, a, politi a political figure. I mean, he he knows how to dominate the news, and I think that's something that should not be underestimated uh, come November. Yeah, but you know, there are things happening now, uh, per our discussion earlier, about how Trump is changing. He's, he's being more rambunctious all the time, uh, taking advantage uh, all the time, more disinformation, confusion, uh, more controversy all the time, firing more people all the time. Um, and you know, I wonder if, I, if I'm a, a Trumper or a Fox News person, and I'm you know, dedicated to supporting him, dedicated to, to the belief, which is widely held among some circles, that he's the greatest president the country has ever seen, and quote, no hyperbole there. Um, and so you know, um, that seems to be increasing. And his outrageous unconstitutional, um, unconstitutional actions, which nobody seems to stop, uh, there's, there's no nobody in the room who's going to stop him from saying, I am all powerful. I am the state. I have all the authority I ever want to have. These are remarkable statements, and you don't need a high school education to appreciate how far off, off course that is. So if anybody is connecting the dots, they're going to see that this is getting worse. And my question to you is, don't you, you know, you have a, I know you have a PhD in political science, Chad. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> so isn't this ultimately going to lose him at least some fringe people in the base when he goes off, off, off the side that way? It's actually American studies, the PhD, but, but it was about politics. I uh, focus exclusively on uh, Hawaii history and politics, but it's kind of like political science. My friend Colin Moore might take offense that I would be called a political scientist, but um, <laughs> is, is it going to lose some fans? Is it going to lose some fans? You know, right now, uh, today, I believe we, we surpassed 25,000 deaths in the United States, uh, a, a really difficult figure to, to try and comprehend. But remember that the forecast uh, from the Trump administration, from health officials like Fauci, has been, you know, 100,000, maybe as much as a quarter of a million. Now we're starting to think maybe the curve is being flattened. 
if May comes around and we go 14 days, two weeks without a new case, and we see those numbers dropping, not in New York yet, but even in New York, Andrew Cuomo is saying, we think we're getting around the corner. There will be people uh, that will say Trump did the right thing. He acted right. Uh, if it's true, whether it's true or not, that's another matter. But uh, those that like him, and there are many, uh, he may be able to to ride that into a second term in the White House, that he's the one who led us um, through the coronavirus. On the other hand, if things do not get better, if the unemployment numbers, uh, uh, the budget situation continues to the stock market, that too will be uh, stick to him and uh, could very well defeat him. And as you know, traditionally, it's the economy more than anything uh, people point to when they decide to reelect a president, whether it's that president's fault or not. In this case, it's probably the coronavirus's fault, but he's the guy at the helm and he's the guy they're going to hold responsible. So I think it, I'll be honest with you, I think it could go either way. As of today, I would give the Democrats the edge. Joe Biden now has Obama's endorsement. It looks like the party is coming together. Bernie Sanders is on board. Uh, but Joe Biden is not the most electrifying candidate in the world. He's got a whole lot of baggage himself. Will his choice of a, a, a woman for a vice president, uh, could, that, could that help him? I think so. I think a woman of color uh, might help as well. And several women of color are, are in the top running. I do think Biden will decide, just as Obama did, who could best run the government, who could step in for me should something happen to me. And uh, there are about 10 uh, women in America, most of them in elected office, uh, that I that we, we hear the names being bandied about, Kamala Harris and, uh, and so forth. But um, I think that will be electrifying. Uh, will, will then Trump fire Mike Pence and ask uh, Nikki Haley? <laughs> to run the <laughs> what I don't know. But um, I, I think, uh, I think uh, it's, he's already said he's going to pick a woman. And I, I think he's going to stick to that. And I think that will be electrifying for all those who mourned uh, Hillary Clinton's loss four years ago. I think that will help a little bit, too. What about the notion of uh, having, a, you know, a Democratic um, National uh, Convention? I mean, that's really hampered. Uh, what, what effect is that politically and, and you know, procedurally? How are we going to how is he going to do that? Uh, or is he going to lose lose ground because there is no precedent for this? There is no president. How do you put, you know, 20,000 people into Zoom? <laughs> uh, I've gone to a convention. I went to the L.A. convention for Al Gore back in 2000. And it's, you know, it's just an enormous event. Uh, we do know that the Democrats have postponed for one month the Milwaukee uh, DNC. It was set for mid-July. It's now mid-August. You've heard Biden and others say maybe we're going to need to to uh, have some sort of remote gathering. But I'll also tell you this, it's, it's really just a coronation. Uh, as much as party members, and I'm gonna get people angry in the Democratic Party, I'm sure, they are picking a platform and, uh, and so forth, but this is Biden's show. This is a done deal. Uh, he, no one else is in the race. I don't think you really need to, to, to meet in, in Moss for four days in Milwaukee. It could still happen if this thing abates, if the virus clears up and that's still four or five months away, you know, you can still hold a convention. Remember the Republicans have their convention planned as well. I think about the same time or that same month. But um, I think uh, these are extraordinary times. And as you mentioned earlier, everyone's having to change the way they do business. And that's what's going to happen with both the DNC and the RNC. What about Cuomo? Do you write him off? I think Cuomo uh, is being honest when he says he's not going to run. Speaking in the New York Times, there was a nice piece the other day on how close Joe Biden and Andrew Cuomo are um, a real relationship. Cuomo's only 66. Biden is in his late 70s. I think Cuomo uh, has really re re turned his his national reputation around. Why, you know, deservedly so. And I think uh, four years from now, or more likely eight years from now, he'd still be younger than Joe Biden or Donald Trump, right? At that time, uh -huh. or just about. And um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't write him off. He's won three terms now as governor of New York and he's not going to work in the cabinet. He already did that. I think it was under Clinton, if I remember correctly. Uh, but I think uh, his national profile is going to stay high. Um, uh, and uh, I just it isn't going to happen now unless something happens uh, to Joe Biden for some reason mm -hmm. health wise this year. And I just mm -hmm. right now that doesn't seem to be the case.
Mm -hmm. Well, that's, um, you know, the, the fact is all this, all the political, um, you know, events that take place between now and the election, or for that matter, after the election, um, and uh, the coronavirus, and in fact, everything we've been talking about, it's all really about how well the press is doing and will do in informing us and telling us the truth. And the press has been under attack in this administration. It's been under attack in a business sense for a long time. And, uh, you know, one of the articles uh, or the books that was uh, referred to in that article in The New Yorker was called Democracy Without Journalism by a fellow named Victor Packard at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. And, you know, I'm wondering, uh, you know, the, the First Amendment has been under attack as never before in concept. It's almost like, you know, Trump would like to throw it out the window, attacking the press, you know, Gratuitously, I mean the the, uh, the conference, uh, rather the press conference yesterday, was a good example of how how far down the road he's gone with attacking the press with for no no good reason, and telling lies and misleading. And what what did uh, the Post of the Times reported that he he has um, you know now up to eighteen thousand lies? That's pretty. That's not only a record, but it's a phenomenon. Um, so my question to you is. What do we do to preserve the First Amendment in the face of this ongoing attack? What do we do to preserve the integrity of, of, of the election in November or, or, or running up to November? I mean, there's an obvious attack on the election process. There's an obvious attack on the press. Uh, there's an obvious, and in so, there's an obvious attack on our constitution. The constitution is in jeopardy as, as had not been the case since the Civil War, I think. Um, so what do you think about that? What can the press do? We talked about the models. We talked about the way they organize, you know, their news. We talked about the consolidation of various media. How are we going to save the media and thus save our democracy and thus save our country? Thanks for that softball question, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't help myself, Chad. <laughs> um, I, obviously, I don't. I don't have the answer for that. I, I will say that I have been heartened by a few things in recent days, um, and by that I mean in the last few weeks or so. Uh, Fox News, the the largest uh, cable news channel uh, in the United States, uh, highly influential, for the longest time, pretty much the mouthpiece of the Trump administration, uh, and vice versa. Um, you have seen people uh, at Fox News start to raise questions and challenge the president. That includes Chris Wallace. I think even Brett Hume the other day uh, said, uh, raised some concerns about the president. And the president has been attacking Fox News. And as we, when I talked earlier, there's a report in the New York Times about Mitch McConnell privately saying that he, he has a whole lot of problems with the president. I think the word nuts is what was used as a description of Mitch McConnell thinking the president is nuts. The problem is, is the president is the biggest bully in the country, in the world, and he will attack ruthlessly. But it, as happened with Richard Nixon in Watergate, eventually enough people came down, came around. And remember, Nixon still had about 35% of the electorate, if I remember correctly, the poll numbers, even with, even after the smoking gun, right? The tapes and the Supreme Court and and all that, and, and still he had people, and Nixon was as big a fighter as, as, as Trump is, and Trump loves to fight more than anything. He loves to be in the mix of it. But you're starting to see some glimmers. Will it change? Will it uh, result in his defeat? I honestly don't know. But remember, one votes in private. One doesn't have to share one's vote, uh, and it will be the electorate that will make that determination. It did four years ago when it sent Trump to the White House, even though he had only, uh, he did not win the, the popular vote. So anything can happen. Yeah, and, and there, there are, um, you know, uh, bright spots. For example, the uh, election was yesterday day before in Wisconsin over that Correct. judge, a uh, de Democratic judge. Uh, that, that was not politicized, That was, or at least it was a Democratic result. And we might see more of that. You know, the funny thing is um, you can appreciate that, you know, under the hood, under the hood, below the media level, people do take these things seriously. They do take the deaths and the coronavirus seriously. Maybe they yes, take they the do. lies seriously. And although, if, you know, for their friends, they may, you know, espouse the base and, you know, be part of the Trump, the Trump following. But, you know, there's still a lot of them still thinking, still thinking. What I, what I worry about is the ultimate numbers, because I think we, we, have a, we have a country that doesn't fully understand the Constitution. 
Uh, we have many generations who came up without an adequate education on that and without an opportunity for critical thinking. And, uh, you know, this, you know, you, you need, can you have a democracy without journalism? Can you have a democracy without the First Amendment? Can you have a democracy without informed citizens? And the answer is probably no. Uh, so to the extent that, you know, we have been at risk up to this point in the Trump administration increasingly, if he wins again, you know, what, what do you think will happen? I mean, it'll, it'll be worse, right? It's surreal to be hearing this question. I, I believe I hear slack key in the background and it's all nice and, <laughs> and, and making me relax and so forth. Um, if he wins the next four years, it's unfathomable what will happen. He will, as Cuomo said, you're not a king. Well, he will be a king uh, if he wins. Uh, it, will be, um, it will be astonishing uh, the authority that he will be given by winning. And Trump loves nothing more than winning. That's his most important goal in life, and uh, and I hate to think what's what it's going to be like. But that's up to us, Jay. That's up to you. That's up to me. The people listening out there, everybody vote. And I think we are going to see a record turnout. Maybe it's going to be by mail and election. I don't know. But uh, it's up to us. It's up to Americans to decide whether they want to keep their democracy or not. Yeah, just a rhetorical question. Can can you actually have a mail in uh, vote if you have no mail? <laughs> I believe the mail is still being delivered. Uh, they're wearing masks. They're wearing gloves. Uh, as you know, Hawaii is all mail-in. There will be some walk-in centers. I don't know that the country is going to go. I don't think it's possible to gear up for a national election. Elections are done at the state level, right? Each state gets to decide how they want to vote. But we're seeing that trend line, too. Hawaii now has joined three or four other states in doing this. And despite what the Republican Party says about being against mail-in ball balloting, Oh, that's the future. Yeah. Well, speaking of the future, we were having a conversation yesterday to try to structure a survey, right? And one of the, one of the people involved in this discussion was saying, we, we have to ask people what they think is, is going to be the case on this issue or that issue in five years' time. I said, five years' time? There's no way in today's world where you could ever predict or speculate or speculate, you can always speculate, but make, make a, you know, make, make a, some expectation about what will happen in five years. You know, how about five months is really hard. Five days, there's so many things happen that are surprising and unpredictable. And there's so many balls in the air, so many vectors, yeah. so many things that could come in from left field and turn everything on its head, you know, yeah. immediately. And this makes the work this is my final question to you, Chad. This makes the work of the press so much more interesting and important because the press has to watch all those balls in the air. They have to see it coming even before it comes. They have to you know, wrap around a, a, an increasingly complex world, a world of news that is filled with disinformation and surprises. How can we do that? You have, you know, we, I think the press has to change its, its mindset um, to be more open to all all possibilities and to be able to integrate on so many variables that it did not have to look at before. What do you think? I'll speak up for the press and say that the reporters, the editors, the news producers, the anchors, everyone else, I think they're doing a hell of a job. I wouldn't say that of every publication or every TV news channel, but I will say uh, most of them are doing stellar work, the best that they've ever done in this country akin to what happened with Watergate with the Washington Post and the New York Times. Uh, but the model, the financial model, that's really going to be up to the people. And so my hopeful note to end on is if you care about the truth, if you care about trying to find out what's going on, and if you care about your country, uh, support your local media like Civil Beat or the Star Advertiser uh, and give them your money. Or the Show New York them. Times. Or the New York Times, or frankly, if you support the Wall Street Journal or even Fox News, I would never make a plea in support of Fox News. But there's even some good people there that I think are doing good work. Uh, Chris Wallace, I'll mention. Um, but uh, if you care about this country, support journalism, uh, particularly local journalism like Civil V. There's my shameless plug. <laughs> Well, you know, the problem is we've had uh, generations that uh, haven't haven't really learned these lessons uh, and that are not attuned, you know, to finding out what's going on and who are uh, suggestible on, on fake news and disinformation. And, and uh, you know, they're, they're voters, they're voters, and they could they not have good thinking because they're not getting the news from the right source or any source. Uh, a lot of people in this country 
You know, they don't like the news. I mean, the campaign against fake news, against the, the enemy of the people has to some extent been successful. They don't want to know. I talked to one guy and said, I saw an article in the New York Times. He said, New York Times. I would never read the New York Times. Really? <laughs> anyway, my question to you, last, totally last question. Okay. What would I you got say to- in about 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I got to well, report happy, the news. <laughs> we'll, we'll be happy to get on that call with you, Chad. Uh, but my, my last question is, gee whiz, what would you say to those people? What would you say to the upcoming generations about the importance of these issues, the importance of, of educating themselves and becoming responsible citizens? What would you tell them? Well, I, I think I've already kind of made my stand, if you will, and why it's so important. This could be a whole other topic of a of a think tank with you on, on the, the younger generation and so forth. I am heartened by the number of people I see still working in journalism, the number of people that are going beyond just superficial headlines and RSS feeds. Maybe it's in my arena that I encounter a lot of people that are pretty, pretty sharp, pretty Akamai, pretty plugged in. Um, but for every uh, down moment, every time I get a little frustrated that someone expresses something like you said, oh, I wouldn't read the New York Times. You know, Jay, I got family members that won't read the New York Times, <laughs> and so, <laughs> and I'm not going to challenge them. I'm not going to try and change them. Uh, I'm I'm going to work, however, to hope that there are more people that do want to believe the New York Times or Civil D or the Star Advertiser uh, than than don't. And those are the ones I think are going to lead us out of this. Yeah, and you're doing it every day. Thank you so Thank much, you. Chad. It's great to talk to you. Great to hear about all these things from you. Great to um, explore um, American studies with you, if you will. <laughs> Thank you so much. Science. <laughs> and Take my care, advice Jay. to you now at the close of our program is go wash your hands. Oh, yeah. oh boy, more than that. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> <Aloha>. <laughs>